Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Her Majesty Queen Rania Al Abdullah of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, accompanied by David Elwood, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Elwood, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I must say, I have done a great many forums in my years here. I'm not quite sure I've ever felt quite a buzz and energy as I feel tonight. And so it's uh, truly a great honor to have Her Majesty here with us tonight. I'm also very pleased to uh, welcome members of Kennedy School's Women's Leadership Board and the Dean's Council who are visiting us this week for their annual meetings. And I'd especially like to thank the Women's Leadership Board because uh, they are, it was through their efforts that we were able to do this visit. And indeed, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Adrian, the Adrian Hall Women's Mentorship Fund uh, that has created this speech. And indeed, this is tonight's inaugural speech. And since Adrian Hall is a tireless advocate for the advancement of women throughout uh, the university and around the world, it's a particularly fitting occasion that we should have uh, Queen Rania on this occasion. <laughs> Her Majesty uh, Queen Rania Al Abdullah was born in Kuwait and received her degree in business administration from American University in Cairo. Since her marriage to the, to the then Prince and now King Abdullah, Queen Rania has channeled her energies into initiatives that aim to improve the well-being of uh, various sectors of society in Jordan and well beyond. Indeed, the Queen is a role model for a great many people because of her great commitment both to, to people and to a future. She's been particularly vocal, especially in recent years, about the importance of cross-cultural and interfaith dialogue and towards a greater understanding of tolerance and acceptance across the world. The, her list of special interests and the ideas she's done is as long as a typical resume here at Harvard. Um, it ranges from she's been a strong advocate for excellence and creativity in education. And indeed, she's, been, she's played an integral role in the introduction of a national uh, childhood development program into the curriculum in Jordan. She has, through her work with the nonprofit uh, organization INJAZ, enabled youths from age 14 to 24 to receive training from private sector volunteers, such as, such as the areas of, le I'm sorry, important areas, such as leadership and finance and market understanding. Indeed, her own past, she was a very significant figure in the private sector as well. She has championed the creation of the first hands-on children's museum in Jordan. Um, she's reflected in the work she's done for the nonprofit Jordan River Foundation, whose vision is to empower society, especially women and children, and in turn, to secure a better quality of life for everyone in Jordan. Through its child safety program and the Dar al Aman Child Safety Center, Her Majesty and the Jordan River Project have worked to protect children from abuse and to rehabilitate abused children and their families. She's also committed to encouraging income generation in Jordan. She is a tireless advocate for microenterprise and has worked on various microenterprise initiatives. She's also a member of the World Economic Forum, the board for the Young Global Leaders Program, a program where the young global leaders will come to the Kennedy School next year, and many other activities, such as in, um, she's one of the nominators for the Young Global Leaders. And in January of this year, she was named UNICEF's first eminent advocate for children. Um, I could go on and on, but of course, the real opportunity here is to listen to our great guest. So without further ado, let me welcome Her Majesty Rania Abdallah of Jordan.
Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Dean Elwood, Mr. White. Let me begin by saying it is wonderful to be with you all in Harvard tonight. It is always a pleasure to visit the US, especially in the midst of such a lively and competitive election season. The tension is tremendous. The atmosphere is electric. The whole country, the whole world is on, on the edge of their seats trying to predict the winner. Will it be Melinda, Lakeisha, or Blake, <laughs> the new American Idol? No, seriously, would you like a speech or a song? <laughs> I have to say that I would rather be graded by Dean Elwood than Simon Cowell any day. <laughs> Indeed, I'm honored to be back in Harvard because eight years ago, I joined my husband, His Majesty King Abdullah here, for his very first address before an American university audience. We were both deeply moved when to mark the occasion the Kennedy School announced a permanently endowed professorship in honor of His Late Majesty King Hussein and a fellowship program to help young Jordanians follow the path of public service that King Hussein personified. We value and appreciate Harvard's support as we build a Jordan that is op modern, open-minded, and engaged in the world. But I also remember my last visit to Cambridge because of the questions the students asked my husband after his speech. As you might expect, the majority were on the challenges of the Middle East. But one curious student wanted to know how my husband reconciled his Western education with the reality of being a king. And without hesitation, my husband replied, if I start to think that I'm a king, then I've got a problem. Like my husband, I am sure that you agree that genuine leadership takes more than just a fancy title. Being a good leader takes judgment, vision, courage to do the right thing. It takes keen instincts and the kind of expert knowledge that you have honed at the Kennedy School. But leadership cannot come from the head, just from the head. It must come from the heart as well. Because every policy, great or small, has a person at the end of it not just an anonymous stranger, but somebody's mother or best friend or son. Someone who has the same rights and dignity and worth as you and me. It may sound obvious, yet it is all too easy to lose sight of in our fast-paced world, where so many challenges are so immense, so entrenched, so intractable. Yet it is all too easy as experts to approach tough problems with our technocratic tools and to debate complex issues on an analytical level far above the ground where people actually live. But as a result, there is sometimes something missing in our global discourse. The moral language of the conscience, the emotional conversation of the heart, the humanitarian perspective that helps us to see through another person's eyes and to empathize person to person, neighbor to neighbor, us to them. The great moral leaders of the 20th century understood the need for such empathy. In addressing the great injustices of their time, such as racism, apartheid, and exclusion, they appealed not only to logic, but to simple human values like acceptance and love. And crucially, each of them underscored our duty to look out for one another and the fundamental dignity that joins each member in the family of humankind. I think of Gandhi, whose greed of non creed of nonviolence sparked a global moral reckoning and who taught that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Or Martin Luther King, who called for a genuine revolution of values, a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation. Or Nelson Mandela, who walked away from 27 years of imprisonment, unbroken, unbowed, extending a hand of reconciliation, not revenge. Or Mother Teresa, who cared for the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta, Believing in the, world of, in the word of St. John, 
that you cannot love God whom you do not see if you do not love your neighbor with whom you live. I believe we must weave that same spirit of caring throughout our public discourse and ensure that we give priority to humanitarian values and concerns. And it may sound soft, but I hope Professor and I will attest that soft can be powerful. <laughs> Indeed, I believe that explicit recognition of our common humanity is an indispensable condition for peace and prog progress around the globe. This is especially true when we look at the tensions between the Muslim world and the West, which for us in Jordan is not an abstraction, but a difficult and daily reality. More than 40 years ago, Martin Luther King described what he called a great world house. In this house, all of humanity will have to learn to get along because we can no longer live without each other. But let us think for a moment of the house our troubled world inhabits today. To be honest, sometimes it feels more like a row of bunkers than a home. The East has occupied one room and the West is in another. And though the landscape outside their windows is the same, they see it very differently because the windows themselves are tinted by each side's experience and perspective. You may have noticed I'm using the word they. I am doing so deliberately. Because, if I may, I would like to try to speak as a neutral observer, as someone who has looked out of both sets of windows and witnessed the contrast in views. My aim is not to pass judgment. I do not want to tell you what to think, but rather to highlight the diverging narratives, the different ways that East and West interpret reality. In particular, I would like to explore the gap in perceptions of the Middle East, where mutual failure to appreciate the other side's point of view is a greater barrier to communication than speaking different languages. The gap begins with a sense, with a different sense of which parts of the landscape stand out. On the issue of Palestine, for example, looking out an American window, the first thing you might see is terrorist attacks against Israelis and Israel's paramount obligation to protect its people from harm. But looking through an Arab window, the image in the foreground is generations of Palestinian boys and girls growing up with no country, no rights, and no future. And that image has not changed for 50 years. Looking at Iraq, I think both sides would agree they see a mess. But where they differ, perhaps, is on the role of the American troops. From the Arab perspective, Iraq is a country whose people have suffered for decades and whose lives have become even worse since the US invasion and occupation. Through the Arab window, the American presence is unwanted, unwelcome, and unjust. However, when Americans look th through their windows, most see US troops performing honorably and heroically, doing their best in very difficult circumstances to put a broken country back together. Or take the status of women. Through Western windows, Arab women may look passive and oppressed, from the way they dress to the role they play in the home and the family unit. Eastern eyes, however, see Arab women taking an even greater role in society, as doctors, lawyers, teachers, journalists, politicians, and entrepreneurs. And at the same time, because Arab culture venerates the family, a woman's predominant role in the household is seen as a source of strength. And, of course, interwoven with almost every issue is the way that both sides view Islam. For many in the East, Islam is a fundamental part of life, a guiding light that, that emphasizes mercy, charity, tolerance, and peace. But for many in the West, perceptions of Islam, what it stands for, what it means, are bound up with the savagery of 9-11. Thus, Looking out the Western window, Islam seems like a threat personified by terrorists who claim to act in God's name. But looking out the Eastern window, Islam is under siege, distorted by violent extremists from within and demonized from without. Now, clearly, these are only generalizations. I do not claim to speak for the East, and I certainly don't claim to speak for the West. 
But I believe the perception gap is real. The gulf between narratives is wide and only getting wider. And as a result, I fear a creeping affliction on both sides of what the philosopher William James called the blindness in human beings that prevents us from the understanding the feelings of those different from ourselves. I have four children. Their names are Hussein, Iman, Selma, and Hashem. And I must tell you, I do not want them to grow up in a house like this. I do not want them to inherit a divided, angry world where East and West have hunkered down alone, separate, in separate rooms. And yet, I am hopeful. Because our world house has a common room as well. It is a room where color, race, and creed do not get in the way. Not because those things do not exist, but because they aren't important. What's important in the common room are the values that we share. The basic belief that each of us is worthy of respect. In the common room, we can strive to understand one another's perspective, to ask and to listen, to share and to trust, to assume the best from one another, not the worst. In the common room, we can help one another to widen the view from the window, to examine the landscape from different angles and in different shades of light and to help one another see nuance and beauty in what might have seemed foreign or strange. In the common room, we can be enriched by one another's diversity because no matter where we come from, what we look like, how we dress, or to whom we pray, when it comes to what makes us laugh or cry, when it comes to how hard we work each day, when it comes to what we dream of for ourselves and for our children, we are usually more alike then we are different. Now, you're probably thinking, any minute she's going to burst into kumbaya. <laughs> I'll spare you that pleasure. Because the common room is not a place for relaxation. It is not a place where we sit on the couch drinking lattes and watching Lost. The common room is where people of goodwill come to work for the common good, to put an end to violence, to fight for peace to build a world fit for children, to use our abundant resources and talents to eradicate global poverty and turn, and turn national borders into global gateways that connect us, not keep us apart. For when we start to identify with one another and to relate to one another's hopes and fears, we start to take responsibility for one another's well-being we see that none of us can be secure as long as any of us are insecure. That living in an interdependent world means being able to depend on one another. And it seems to me there are a lot of Harvard people in the common room already. Crusading journalists, courageous public servants, pioneers of public health, the students and faculty who have been helping the citizens of New Orleans to rebuild their lives. It seems to me this university is just the kind of place that can help turn the vision of the common room into a common way of life. Some of you may recall when Conan O'Brien gave the class day address in 2000. And he warned the graduates they were in for a lifetime of, and you went to Harvard? <laughs> As Conan put it, give the wrong amount of change in a transaction and it's, and you went to Harvard? Ask the guy at the hardware store how these jumper cables work in here. And you went to Harvard? <laughs> Forget just once that your underwear goes inside your pants and it's, <laughs> and you went to Harvard? <laughs> but ask yourselves, what does it really mean to have a Harvard degree? The world already knows it means you are among the best and brightest. Indeed, those were the very qualities that got you here in the first place. But let your ties to this great university mean something more than that. Let your Harvard credentials signify moral courage and compassion. Let it mean you approach a stranger with an open mind and an open heart. Let it mean the spirit of the common room is with you wherever you go. And know the people of Jordan will always be ready to meet you there. Thank you all very much.
Wow. Uh, so let me uh, explain what's going to happen here. Uh, I'm going to have a brief, use the opportunity to uh, briefly ask a few questions uh, of Her Majesty uh, for 10, 10 minutes or so, whatever, 15 perhaps. And then we will open up to questions from the audience. So let me start. I was very struck by your term about the gulf between narratives mm -hmm. and this uh, finding the common room. So it sounds great in concept. So what does one do to get people who are outside the common room to see the different narratives? What can a place like this do to help us see that, those different narratives and, and get to the common room? Well, I think the, uh, we have to, first of all, acknowledge the problem. You know? When we look at our world today, um, one of the most immediate threats that we see are the extremists. And the danger that they manifest in a very visible way uh, is the terrorist attacks, for example. But we need to realize that beyond that, uh, and even more dangerous than that, are the undercurrents of fear and suspicion that exist in our world, particularly between East and West. Both view each other with great mistrust and misunderstanding. And I think that's a dangerous phenomenon because when people have this, uh, uh, this kind of feeling, then they choose isolation over integration. So you have the extremists who have succeeded in promoting a, um, an ideology of hatred that has now turned into a culture of fear in our part of the world and therefore has pulled people apart. And we have to, take, we have to play a very active ro role in not letting that happen. And I think it has to happen through dialogue. Uh, through mutual understanding. We have to challenge our assumptions about each other. It's always so easy to just jump to stereotypes and make sweeping judgments, but that strips people of their identity. So it's, we have to approach it by trying to acquire more knowledge uh, about each other, which will lead to more respect and hopefully uh, more acceptance. You know, we talk about tolerance and acceptance as ideals, but we need to translate that into a way of life. We need to integrate it into the way that we do things. And, there, uh, and most importantly, I think, is dealing with some of the unresolved uh, conflicts in, in our region, for example. Uh, when we look at our region, we have conflicts such as Iraq, uh, we have the war in Lebanon, and most importantly is the issue between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which has been left to fester for far too long and has left such feelings of despair and anger and frustration uh, in our part of the world. And, uh, and the perceived uh, um, alignment of US policy with uh, Israel has created a, a sense of a mistrust of, uh, of the United States. So helping to resolve some of those outstanding issues, I think, will really clear the air a little bit and lay the foundation for better understanding between East and West and for us to meet in that common room. Because I think the common, when I talk about the common room, it's not just about uh, East or West or whatever. It's about making sure that moderates on all sides come together against extremists of all sides. Extremists are not Muslims. Extremists are not only Muslims, but you have extremists from many different countries. Yes. You know, uh, not, not everyone will realize that you uh, also had a career in business working for Citibank and mm -hmm. Apple. And recently, you've been talking about something that I find very intriguing and, again, very much connected with this. Many of us know the term corporate social responsibility. Right. But you're talking about corporate multicultural responsibility. And uh, tell me more about that and how, because how, that sounds like a very different and interesting idea for, for getting to, the, to this common room. Well, exactly, because, I mean, that's an extension of uh, this bridge that we need to, to build in our world. And, uh, and I basically feel that, um, you know, having traveled uh, around the world and having uh, uh, visited so many countries and interacted with so many cultures, it's, I'm always struck by how similar we are intrinsically and at the most basic of human le levels. But I'm also struck by how much stereotyping there is and how much of a, a gap there is. And it's all in the perception. And we all have a role to play uh, in, in, this, in bridging this gap. And I think the private sector has a very important role. I feel sometimes that globalization has outpaced us in a, in a way. Uh, we've globalized in some of the tangible things, in, in getting our products all over the world, in communication tools, in um, uh, having companies everywhere. But we haven't globalized in the human elements. Um, and, and for example, the private sector companies now uh, there are so many multinationals, and they can play a very, very important role 
in trying to get their work team to have that globalized uh, point, of, point of view and perspective of the world. And I think one of the major challenges that faces our century is how we can view the rest of the world with a little bit more sophistication, knowledge, and detail. So when multinationals uh, take it upon themselves to ensure that their employees are well versed in the different cultures in the world, uh, they give them proper training courses, uh, they make sure that those who have worked in other countries come back to the, uh, to the company and brief other employees, then you get a globalized and a diversified workforce. And uh, not only is that good in, term, in a moral sense, but it's also very good for the company's bottom line because companies who are more sensitive to the, the markets in which they work, uh, companies who understand the needs of their consumers, are at the end of the day going to be more profitable. So you know, it's not just enough to talk about corporate social responsibility. I think for this uh, coming phase in, in our world, we have to think of corporate multicultural responsibility for companies to, to think of making sure that their employees know, take it upon themselves to make sure that their employees know about, enough about the world. That's a very, very interesting idea. Are there, are there any examples out there of people doing this already that you're aware of? Well, uh, companies now do train uh, their employees on, um, you know, when they send their employees out to work in different countries, they give them information. But it's not the kind of information that is useful for our day, uh, present day. Um, it's mostly dry facts, you know, it's like, okay, you go into this country, this is, an, this is the population, uh, this is the kind of food they eat, this is maybe how you should dress, but they don't give the, the actual, uh, the more detailed cultural aspects that people need. And again, uh, there's nothing that beats face-to-face, human-to-human interaction, getting that kind of knowledge. Uh, you also mentioned uh, the role of women, uh, especially in, in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about what you see the emerging role of women and what, what needs to be done so that they can play an even more significant role. In you mean women in the Arab world? Yes. Well, firstly, uh, women in the Arab, the, the Arab world is made of different countries, so women in different countries have achieved different levels of progress. And in many ways, the challenges that Arab women faced are similar to ones that are faced uh, all over the world. Yet, we still have a long way to go, and I think um, one of the major challenges is really getting women into the workforce. Uh, the Arab world has, been, uh, has done very well in, in, in spending a lot, on investing a lot in getting women into the schools and universities. And we have good results as a, as, a, as a result of that. But then we find that when it comes to the workforce, very few actually end up, we have one of the lowest rates of female participation in the workforce. So, so that's something that really needs to be looked at. And it's not just about changing policies, but it's actually about changing mindsets. And uh, for that reason, I think it's an evolutionary process because changing mindsets takes a little bit longer. Uh, there, it's, people are still have the mentality of being protective over women. Of uh, um, you know, uh, and I, we always say that uh, a ship in the harbor is harbor harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. So there is sometimes this culture of dependency. So I think it's going to take some time to challenge traditional mindsets and to erode negative stereotypes that exist about women uh, in the Arab world. For women themselves to be more educated about their own rights uh, and to demand those rights. And so we're working really with the grassroots to make sure that women themselves um, understand what, what, what they're capable of. And also for women who've made it, who've actually broken through gender barriers, to also help other women uh, uh, along the way and to offer uh, good examples. Well, that's, and uh, presumably schooling is a big part of this, and you've been very involved in that. And also schooling must be a very big part of, of uh, uh, bridging the gulf between narratives. How does that work? What have you been doing there that would make a difference? Well, you know, education, I think, is the E for equality and empowerment when it comes to women. I mean. Uh, uh, nothing uh, can give women more tools than to, to, to really forge forward and, and fulfill her dreams in having the education. And uh, in Jordan, we've, um, we've managed to have gender equality uh, uh, in schools, and we have the lowest female illiteracy rate. So we're, we've done very well in that, but that's not enough. We're still you know, pushing forward, pushing for not just numbers, but quality and, and, and innovative uh, education. Um, and yes, when, when we talk about the divide between East and West, it begins with education. It's the kind of values that you instill in your children. 
So we always have to look at our curricula and make sure that we're teaching our children the right things, giving them the confidence in who they are and in their own country and their own tradition, but at the same time, not for them not to fear to be part of this global community that we live in. And I think that's a balance that most countries are now ha grappling with, is how do you keep, stick to your identity but still feel like you're part of this world? Well, I'd love to ask you about microenterprise and all the many, many other things you're involved in, but I'm monopolizing it. So let me just remind all of you about the ground rules here for questions. First of all, there are microphones located here, 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 and here. Uh, and we'll just rotate through them. A uh, couple ground rules. First of all, many of you can recite by heart. Uh, a good question has several characteristics. It opens by uh, your telling us who you are. Second of all, it involves one and only one small thought. Uh, third, uh, it is short. And fourth, it ends with a question mark. Um, let me also um, uh, emphasize that Her Majesty is certainly willing to and open to all kinds of questions. But you, I just would remind you that she's not a policymaker. She is not the, uh, involved in making uh, domestic or foreign policy kinds of decisions. Uh, her role has been one much more of building uh, the social and human capital uh, in Jordan and throughout the world. So with that, let me begin right over here. Good evening, Your Majesty. <laughs> well, it's pretty cool to be able to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call my mom later on until I spoke to her. <laughs> you can stop there. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to have you here. I'm Steve Cohen. I'm a first year uh, Kennedy School student and in the master's program here. And I wanted to ask you about the role of parents. Um, you know, we talk a lot in my home about what my mom and, and dad have taught me. And much of that, I think, comes from my parents. And I wonder if you look at Arab countries and people in other parts of the world, uh, sometimes I wonder what they're learning in the home. And I'm wondering how we can influence parents who perhaps, I would argue, are more fixed in their ways. They come with a certain set of beliefs and they've taken with them throughout their lives, and so they teach perhaps much of that to their children. Mm -hmm. And I wonder you know, what we can do to influence those who are more fixed to uh, convince them to teach their children more tolerance and understanding, not just in the Arab world, but perhaps also here in the States. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question, because I think that uh, you know, you're right. Uh, much of what, what we're made of is, is partly what we learn in school and, and partly what our parents teach us. And I, for one, always feel that it's important for me not to pass my own uh, perceptions and my own uh, stereotypes or whatever it is I have to my children, but let them give them the right principles and values and let them make their own decisions as they get older and let them uh, have their own uh, perceptions and make up their own judgments as, as they go along. But in general, you know, how do we influence the parents? As I said, you know, we need to make sure that we create a, a culture that promotes the values of tolerance, acceptance, and, and moderation. It has to become uncool to pass stereotypes about, about other people. It's, it's got to be wrong to just to say, you know, okay, he's a Muslim, okay, that means he's fanatical. Oh, he's American, that means uh, they're arrogant and they're only after our oil. You know, I mean, that, that, that's just oversimplification of, of the world. And, and I think that parents have to realize that, that there's a grave responsibility and, the, and, and they can be making a grave mistake just by making such simple uh, statements. And occasionally, you know, my own children come back from school and they make s statements that, that, that are, you know, like that. And I wonder, where, where did you hear this from? You know, and obviously they've heard it from their classmates and their classmates have probably heard it from their parents. And I just think that that's so irresponsible from, from parents to do that. Thank you. And if they can't pass on the right values, then they should refrain from saying anything. <laughs> Easier said than done. Right up here. Hi, um, my name is Nadia Gaber. I'm a sophomore at the college and the president of the Society of Arab Students. Um, so welcome, Athens. It's nice to see you. Um, I was just wondering if you could. Um, sorry. Um, Sorry. Um, so last year, several members of our organization went to the Middle East um, to do a recruiting trip to try and increase um, uh, the number of Arab students at Harvard. Um, and Jordan was one of the countries we visited. And as we were doing our trip, we began to realize sort of more and more that, A, we were visiting schools um, that were already very privileged and perhaps didn't need as, as much. And B, that we were almost trying to cull, um, I guess, like the best of the best and the brightest students and bring them here. Um, and you just spoke to 
um, the conflict of sort of uh, maintenance of identity and you know the search for modernization, education, et cetera. So I was wondering if you could just comment on maybe your reactions um, to that ideology and, and what's going on in Jordan. Um, we also spoke with several people in the government about um, the problem of academic brain drain there with uh, many people coming to the West to study and perhaps not returning to Jordan and maybe what the state of that is right now. I didn't understand the first part of your question. What was, Sorry. What, what was the first part? Um, just that if you could speak to uh, maybe the problem of academic brain drain of people coming academic to the West to study drain. here and um, perhaps not returning. Right, right. Well, that's an issue that we all uh, have to deal with because, um, you know, it's all about creating opportunity for people in our country. You know, at the end of the day, you know, if we can provide them with a, a chance to have a career, uh, to, to fulfill their aspirations, to get a well-paying uh, well job, then you know, they're going to return to their countries because at the end of the day, that's where they feel they belong. So you know, we're, we're in Jordan trying to promote investment in our country, trying to pursue um, uh, reform in economic reform, social and political reform, um, encouraging the private sector to play more of a role. Uh, opening up for civil society, all those things it's at, the, at the macro level, um, policies that are conducive uh, to bringing talent back in. Because at the end of the day, we all know that in today's world, it's not about natural resources. It's about being able to attract, retain, and motivate talent. And that's, 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 good. that's always a determining factor of any nation nowadays. So, it's incumbent on every nation to create the right environment to bring uh, and attract that talent, and that's what we're aiming to do. Thank you. Very good, right up here. Hello, Your Majesty. My name is Ellen Frith. I have a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School in World Religions and Social Ethics, and I'm here uh, working with interfaith dialogue into public policy. Mm -hmm. And I'm also an advisor for Students for Peace, mm -hmm. which are all of the area Boston colleges. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank you very much for what you've shared. I agree with uh, pretty much everything that you've said. And I also want to thank you when I visited Jordan and the refugee camps in Jordan of the, for the Palestinian refugee camps, also in Israel, and not where the refugee camps were, but in Palestine. And I want to thank you for the hospitality and the generosity that I experienced when I was in Jordan. Uh, what I'd like to ask you about is the interfaith dialogue. I saw that that's one of the things that you're involved with as well. And I think it's important to have that be part of a curriculum in education mm -hmm. where sometimes people may not choose to do interfaith dialogue unless they have to as part of a curriculum, mm -hmm. not in a, you know, a difficult way, but in a way that would enhance their ability, as you said. I think it's important to do that in business but I think it's important to do that in academia as well. And what I'd like to uh, find out is how we can, here at Harvard and the area, uh, Boston area colleges, connect with you and uh, some of the other uh, leaders in the Middle East to actually create this interfaith dialogue on a global level, because right now we're all encamped. Mm -hmm. And if you have any ideas or any resources that we could connect with, thank you. Absolutely, I think, I think that's very, very important because we can't allow the extremists to dominate the, the, the discourse. Um, and at the, you know, extremist voices are always the loudest. And although they may be the minority, but because their voices are so loud, they tend to dominate the conversation. And we, if we leave a vacuum, then they have their way. And so the worst thing that we can do is be complacent. So moderates from all religions should come together and find this common ground and, and, and really instill uh, this interfaith uh, dialogue. And it's not enough, for example, in Jordan, we realize that it's not enough just to condemn um, extremist ideology, but it's also important to confront it. It's not just, you can't just say that what they're saying is wrong, but you have to propagate what's right. And that's why we came up with the Amman message, which, is, uh, which brought many Islamic scholars from all over the world together from different jurispr jurisprudence to come together and uh, really speak reaffirm the values of uh, what, what the Muslim, what Islam is about, uh, to condemn some of the extremist act, to, to condemn violence, to, uh, to condemn the taking of innocent lives. Um, and so there is that debate and dialogue taking place within Islam, but it's important to take that dialogue between the different 
uh, the three monotheistic religions, which have so much more in common uh, than, than we all think, and which are actually have much more in common that, than what, what, what differences they have. So um, if we can connect, then absolutely that's something that we should do. We can, for example, the, the people who worked on the Amma message could be in touch with you, and we should create this network all over the world of moderates from all uh, three religions should all come together as a community. Right down here. Hi, my name's Charles Sagano. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I have a question about microfinance. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me, uh, and I'm sure you know much more about it than I do, that microfinance has taken hold more successfully outside the Arab world. And my question is, um, is microfinance for women in the Arab world um, a way to, to promote their position in society? Or is it the, does it come, need to come the other way around, where somehow the position of women in Arab society um, needs to be kind of improved by other, other means before microfinance can take hold? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, microfinance uh, came into the Arab world uh, relatively, relatively recently, but it's really taken, uh, taken very quickly. And uh, in fact, the growth in microfinance in the Arab world is now uh, outstripping that in Latin America. And uh, uh, however, the only impediment that we have is that the demand is outstripping uh, the financing. So we have a financing gap. Uh, but our experience has been that it's been a, a very, very successful tool to eradicate poverty. Uh, we've ha we've, we have many microfinance projects in Jordan. Um, and uh, in fact, most of the beneficiaries, I would say almost 70% of them, are women. And we found that it's been a very empowering tool for women. You know, the fact that they earn an income translates into more decision-making power for them in their households and in their communities. And I've seen women transformed as a result of that because suddenly, you know, they have control over their own lives. Uh, they can provide for their children. Uh, they can, you know, they're, they're more respected in their, in their family and in their communities. And some of them even start to have the self-confidence to venture out into public life and they want to do more. So uh, for me, it is a tool to improve people's quality of life and to eradicate poverty, but also it's a very good tool to get women to be more active participants uh, in, in all walks of life. So uh, it's, it's, microfinance has taken on very quickly in the Arab world. And I think within the next few years, we're going to see many more microfinance clients, mostly women again. Right over here. Hi, my name is Yunji Kim. I'm a master of public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I was, you talked about diverging perceptions um, in the Middle East, and I was wondering if your Palestinian background has influenced or shaped the vision uh, you have about the Middle East. And I was also wondering if you could share the most difficult challenge you faced as a queen or a leader. Well, that was two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would. <laughs> The fact that uh, I'm a Jordanian of Palestinian origin who was born in Kuwait and who lived in Egypt and who's traveled <laughs> all over the Arab world just means that I have a better understanding, I think, uh, of, the, of what the Arab world is about. I truly feel that I'm a product of the Arab world and Arab culture. And that just makes me more sensitive to, uh, to the situation, to how people think, to what kind of challenges they face, to what they aspire to. And that has helped me tremendously. I think one of the major challenges uh, th that I find is the, um, the misperceptions. I find them very um, uh, frustrating just to see, uh, to know the Arab world so well, and at the same time to know the West so well, and to have so many American friends, and then to see and to know that how similar we are, and yet how differently we view each other. Um, I find that very, very uh, frustrating and a major challenge. And, for me, uh, as a woman, as an Arab, and as a Muslim, it also hurts me to, to, to see how many uh, negative stereotypes there are about Arab women. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, people just, just judge women according to how they dress. And if you're wearing a veil, that means you're backward. And if you dress Western, that means you're too um, Westernized. You know? and so these kinds of things, I think, are, are, are quite difficult uh, to, to face, and I think we have to confront some of these uh, stereotypes. That's been quite difficult. Thank you. 
right up here. Your Majesty, thank you very much for your trip here to the Kennedy School. My name is Cornelia Cho. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Last year during my trip to Jordan, I was taken by how entrenched identities were formed against another people. For example, Palestinians' entire identities were formed against Israelis and vice versa. And I'm wondering, with such a large gap, how we can bridge this and what we can do, we as Muslims, as Arabs, as Israelis, as Jews, and as inhabitants of the West, to bridge this. Thank you. Well, you know, I think we need to look at it at both level, levels, the level of the leadership and the level of the people. At the end of the day, peace deals are signed by leaders, but they're endorsed by the people. Uh, between the leaderships, I think we need to f look for the will. And I'm not just talking about the political will, but the will that comes from the heart and from the conscience and from the sense of morality. How long are people going to continue to suffer? You know, we've had decades and decades of bloodshed and violence. And people, uh, generations who have never known peace, uh, it is important for both sides to have the moral courage to come together and put an end to this, to see that, to look beyond uh, political gains in the short term, but to think of the future for their people. And I think they have a responsibility uh, to do that. Um, for them to, for both sides to realize that at the end of the day, neither side is going to walk out with their ideal case scenario. There has to be compromise, and compromise does not mean defeat. Compromise can be viewed as a peace offering for, 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 in order to achieve the end goal. I always say peace requires a great deal of courage, and peace can only be achieved through a great deal of guts, not guns. So, uh, so as I said, we need, we need both sides to come together, uh, and we have a, an incredible opportunity at this stage because we have the Arab Peace Initiative. Um, and this is where all the Arab countries have come together and agreed on certain points and made this proposal to the Israelis. Uh, and in this proposal, um, Israel is to withdraw from the lands that it had occupied in 1967, uh, for there to be an independent, viable Palestinian state established, and for there to be a resolution to the issue of the refugees in return for Israel signing peace treaties with all the Arab world, being completely integrated into the Arab neighborhood, and having normal relations, so in other words, normalization. So this deal takes into, into, uh, uh, takes into account both sides, uh, both their concerns in terms of security, identity, and independence. So this is a great opportunity. Never before in, his, in the history have you had this kind of collective will to achieve this. And as for the people, I think we all have a role to play. We all have to advocate for uh, peace in the Middle East because we all realize that we have a stake in this peace. You know, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians is the wellspring of anger and frustration, not only in our region, but in the entire uh, world. So all of us have to advocate for it. Uh, we have to speak up for it. We have to demand it from our countries. We all have to realize that this issue if it's, not, if it's not resolved today, if it's not resolved soon, then we may not have a chance in the future. And if we don't resolve it, the only winners are the extreme and radical voices. They are the people who do not want peace. Because if we have peace, then it strips them of their ability to attract people into their fold. Thank you. Right here. Hi, my name is Leia, and I am a senior at the college. And you talked a lot about misperceptions of the other, about Americans misinterpreting what, who Arabs are and Arabs misinterpreting Americans. I wonder what you view as the media on both sides' role in propagating these stereotypes and what we can do in the US and what you can do in the Arab world to counter that. Thank you. Well, the media plays a very, very important role. and. Uh, you know, media comes in different shapes and colors, and we know that there are stations both here and our part of the world who, who have a particular points of view and particular agendas. But I think we have to be sensitized to uh, radical views when we, when we hear them. Uh, it's up to us. I mean, information is out there. 
everywhere, whether it's uh, TV stations or on the computer or whatever, but it's up to us to, to question some of the things that we hear and to try to verify and to do, really do our homework. As I said earlier, we have to challenge assumptions that are being made and not just take things at face value. This will have to be the last question. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Serena Rosso is my name. I'm from Australia, and I'm involved in education, training, recruiting. And we recruit um, educational level all over the world, and it's my business. Today, you've totally inspired me. You're the modern queen, uh, the 21st century queen, and you have a voice where you're really a universal force. I just ask you, what are your objectives in the next five years? What would you like to feel when you sit back in five years from now and say I've achieved two things? Can I have three? Yeah, you can have three. <laughs> well, uh, at the end of the day, I, I want a, a prosperity and, uh, and an opportunity for the for the people of jo for the children of Jordan and their families. I think that's my you know main mandate and my primary goal. I'd like to see a resolution, as I said, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, um, because as I said, that that will take care automatically of a lot of. Uh, of the problems that exist in, in our world. And I'd like to see the bridging uh, of this gap between East and West. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Can I impress on you for one more question sure, since sure, I miss, sure. somehow miss went around the room and I just want to be fair. Last question here. Thanks. My name is uh, Michaela Spelt. I'm a mid-career. In my previous and next life, I will be again a German diplomat. Um, I, my question for you is um, the role of women in the Muslim world. And what struck me again, also with the question asked prior to me, is that Islam is often equated with the Arab world. Now, I have served in Bangladesh, where actually microfinance comes from, and it was developed within the Muslim world, and people often forget that. Mm -hmm. And there, and in many other Islamic or Muslim countries, women are very strong at universities in teaching and so on and so forth, often a higher percentage than in the Western world. but where could you see that women play a more important role in politics? Because in these countries, they lack a lot. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, again, um, I think sometimes uh, this is the status of women um, is when, it's, when women are not playing a, a prominent role. I think they, sometimes people use Islam to, as, as the, uh, to blame. But you find that similar challenges for women in, in developing countries. Uh, so it's more related to the economic situation, it's more related to the social situation, the political situation, rather than Islam. And that's why you find so many commonalities with uh, women in, in those parts of the world. And I agree with you that um, we still have a long ways to go in terms of women uh, playing a, more of a role in politics, but there is progress being made. We have, for example, women in Kuwait recently just got uh, their full political rights. Uh, we have women in Palestine who uh, p participated and won municipal elections and, uh, and they won several seats. Um, women in Iraq participated in, in the elections. Uh, in Jordan, the UAE and Lebanon, you have women ministers. But still, we still have some ways to go in terms of women getting into the political sphere. And that's just something, as I said, it's an evolutionary process. It's something we have to continuously fight for. It's, uh, but there are encouraging signs, I have to say. Latest polls have shown that men, more and more men, are acknowledging and valuing women's participation. So we're getting there. But it's just, it's going to take some time. But, you know, a lot of perseverance and, and will. Your Majesty, thank you so much. Thank Very you.